for the whole course so far, we have been located entirely inside South Africa. We haven't looked outside our borders. We haven't examined what was going on in the rest of Southern Africa. We haven't looked at the influences that were uh, impacting on the negotiations process and the whole transition. So my objective for this session is to try and locate the transition to democracy firstly in its regional context and then to examine some shifts in the global political economy following the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet bloc and to explore how the fast-changing global and Southern African context limited local room to maneuver in the South African transition. And we've spoken about historic compromises that were made. We need to try to understand the forces that influenced those compromises which led to a new constitution and a democratic order. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a whistle-stop tour of countries in Southern Africa between 1960 and 1990, our neighbors, people who were supporting uh, South Africa in its time of struggle. I don't know whether people have read uh, the new book that's come out by Hugh McMillan called The Lusaka Years. So this chronicles the, the, the period of time that the ANC was in Zambia. Uh, Zambia, as you know, became independent in 1964 and very shortly after that, the ANC first started to establish a presence. And Zambia took uh, a very active stance in supporting Zimbabwean independence movements following the U UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence of Rhodesia, Ian Smith, in 1965. In 1969, Zambia took steps to nationalize the copper mines. Now, this was a very interesting period. And what the ANC has said subsequently, having been in Zambia and having seen the implications and the, the impacts of nationalization, uh, which is why the ANC uh, withdrew that from their, uh, their sort of program when it came to negotiations, because people were saying, well, we've seen what's happened uh, as a consequence of uh, nationalization firsthand in Zambia. In 1972, Zambia became a one-party state with, under Kenneth Kaunda with UNIP as a ruling party. And then we see the first attempts by South Africa to try and broker deals in Southern Africa. So we had B.J. Forster uh, met with Kenneth Kaunda on a railway train over the Victoria Falls and they, they shared jokes about uh, uh, their different perspectives on what was going on. And then I think what we need to recognize is that Zambia, particularly in the late 1970s, as the liberation struggle in Zimbabwe hotted up and the war became intense, they suffered intensely as the last phase of that, uh, that process. So they were part of the sanctions and border closure uh, process, which meant that they didn't have a good trade line to the sea. But Rhodesian forces uh, launched enormous raids on Zambia, uh, and particularly because Zipra had developed a uh, conventional war capability. They, had, they were planning an invasion of Zimbabwe in the last period of the, uh, 1979. Uh, they had amassed tanks, heavy weaponry. They even had some access to some MiG fighters that were elsewhere. The attempt by the Rhodesians was to go into Zambia and to destroy all the road networks and the bridge links. So there was amazing damage done to Zambia at that time. Uh, at the same time, the copper price collapsed, and this is where nationalization in Zambia started to unravel. So Zambia was forced to borrow from the IMF, and we are all familiar with structural adjustment, so they had now to reduce government spending, uh, and then they started having issues with food prices rising, and then the opposition in Zambia started to gather force. In 1990, there were food riots. In 1991, there was a multi-party constitution and the movement for multi-party democracy under Hendrik Chiluba defeated Kaunda. Okay, so 1991, Zambia, uh, which had been housing the ANC, has a change of government. The change of government is not at all uh, sympathetic to the ANC. So the ANC 
which had had its offices in, and uh, what have you in Zambia, is, is impacted on by this change. Okay, if we look at Mozambique, uh, in 1964, armed struggle commenced in Mozambique. In 1974, there was a coup in Portugal, which led to an agreement for the Portuguese colonies. In 1975, Mozambique became independent and immediately declared itself a socialist one-party state. Mozambique's policy was that chiefs should be excluded from state and party structures from the outset. Mazibuka uh, was talking about feudalism, and that was the exact language that uh, Frelimo used at the time. They regarded chiefs as being a feudal hangover from the past, and they were marginalized. They also went on a process of nationalization and villagization. Okay, so we've been talking about betterment in South Africa, which is villagization, but we've also unfortunately seen other examples of villagization in Africa, Tanzania, Ujamaa, and also in Mozambique, the, estab the establishment of these big collective state farms. Okay, so this was a period of intense struggle, and you will remember that when Mozambique uh, got its independence, there was a ripple in South Africa. Uh, there, it, 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 it stimulated like mobilization in the country. And just to remind you, this is what, um, this is what Samora Michelle was sounding like at the time. The struggle continues. A luta continua! A luta continua! Against what? Against what must the struggle continue? Contra o tribalismo. Against tribalism. A luta And what else must we struggle Contra against? Contra ignorancia. Against ignorance. Contra o analfabetismo. Against illiteracy. Contra a exploração do homem pelo homem. Against exploitation. Contra superstição. Against superstition. Contra a miséria. Against misery. Contra fome. Against Contra hunger. Contra o pé descalço. Against lack of clothing. A luta continua. The struggle continues. Para que sejamos todos homens iguais. So that someday we will all be equal. Okay, I'm sorry if you couldn't hear that, but that was... Samora Michelle in uh, vintage form. If we could try and get that mic fixed, I've got some other clips I'd like to play later on. Um, I don't know whether it's the battery. Okay, so in the dying years of, uh, of the Rhodesian uh, liberation struggle, the Rhodesians now supported the establishment and the training of Renamo. Okay, this was set up by a Rhodesian CIO chief, the chief of intelligence, whose name was Ken Flower, and it immediately started to recruit disaffected uh, Mozambicans, uh, people who had been arrested. If you, you remember, Alfonso de uh, la Cama had been arrested by um, Frelimo and imprisoned. So they were able to draw on people who had become disaffected by Frelimo, and they began to train and arm them. In 1980, when Zimbabwe got its independence, South Africa took over support uh, of Renamo from Rhodesia, and at that time, the South African Defence Force budget was 15% of the total national budget, and P.W. Boerta declared uh, total strategy. So we now start to see in Mozambique the 1981 raid on Motola, all sorts of raids in Southern Africa, Lesotho, Zimbabwe, Swaziland, Botswana, and by 1981, between 1981 and 1988, there were reported 900,000 civil war-related deaths and 870,000 refugees from Mozambique in neighboring countries. So this gives you an idea of the scale of destabilization from Rhodesia and South Africa and how difficult it was for Mozambique to continue to support the ANC, and why in 1984 it was forced into the Nkomati Accord. So Mozambique forced, uh, was forced to drop support for the ANC in exchange for a pledge from South Africa to end the backing of Renama, which of course South Africa ignored. They signed the deal, 
and they continue to provide support to Renamo. Thank you. Right, and then of course things started to unravel in Mozambique, very similar to Zambia, uh, and many people have reflected on why Renamo got this support. And I think this was a very salutary lesson again for the South African negotiations because the complete sidelining of chiefs, uh, the villagization process that moved people around the country created a fertile uh, sort of environment for discontent in the countryside which the South Africans, the Rhodesians managed to capitalize on and then it generated a momentum of its own. So, in 1984, Mozambique has a structural adjustment program. This results in cuts in government spending and currency devaluation in exchange for loans. Very high social costs. This leads up to 1989. Think about where we are in our own history in 1989. Mozambique abandons Marxism-Leninism, and we also have student demonstrations against corruption in Frelimo, in, in, inside uh, Mozambique. In 1990, at exactly the same time as our negotiation processes are taking place, Mozambique adopted a new constitution and a multi-party democracy. Okay, so there's a trend here which we're going to start to see. If we look at Angola and Namibia, in 1966 we saw the launch of the Namibian arms struggle. In 1975 we see independence in Angola and then immediate conflict in Angola between the MPLA, the FNLA, and UNITA. And immediately also covert South African military intervention and subsequent forced withdrawal. But as soon as Angola became independent, both SWAPO and the ANC were able to establish bases in Angola, but Angola became a battleground for the Cold War. The MPLA was supported by Cuba, and the Soviet bloc, not always in a very harmonious relationship. The FNLA, Holden Roberto, was supported by the DRC, uh, Mobuto, and uh, the CIA, and then South Africa supports UNITA, as did Kenneth Kaunda for a time. So uh, politics got very, very uh, messy in, uh, in, in Angola. Uh, we then see a very big FAPLA offensive against uh, uh, UNITA, and then in 1987, uh, the battle of uh, South African intervention and the battle of Quito Carnivale, leading to the withdrawal of South African troops, and the followed negotiation agreement on the withdrawal of Cuban troops from Angola, which led to an agreement on the independence for Namibia. But this agreement also led to the closure of MK bases in Angola and the relocation of combat combatants to Tanzania. So everywhere around the, the southern Africa, the ANC uh, and MK were like advocating armed struggle, but like its bases were being pushed back, its uh, operational capability was being reduced. 1990, we see uh, Namibian independence. 1991, Angola drops Marxism-Leninism in favor of a multi-party system, but unfortunately this did not bring peace. As we know, the civil war raged in Angola until 2002 with the killing of Savimbi by government troops. In Zimbabwe, in 1980 we had independence in Zimbabwe. Uh, we had ZANU winning the elections, and then unfortunately, similar to the Angolan situation, we had contestation in Zimbabwe between ZANU and ZAPU, uh, and we also had South African destabilization in Zimbabwe. Uh, the big arsenal of weapons was blown up in Bulawayo. Uh, the half of the Zimbabwean Air Force was, was uh, destroyed in an attack on the uh, Gweru Air Force Base. And in the political contestation that was going on in Zimbabwe, uh, there was now big fallout because you had ex-combatants who were uh, in camps all around the, the in, in uh, camps that where they were kept uh, as part of the lead-up to independence uh, in demobilization points, as they were called. And then there was a process of reintegrating those combatants into a national army. Um, ZAPU had focused much more on conventional military training. Its combatants 
if you remember, they had fought alongside the MK in the in the Wanki and Sipulilo campaigns. They had primarily been trained in, in East Germany and the Soviet Union, whereas uh, ZANU had been trained by the Chinese, and they had followed much more of a, a, a process of political work where a person would get a weapon and they'd go and become a political activist. So when it came time for reintegration of the National Army, ZAPU people who were the minority were very well placed to get good positions, but they were very soon pushed out, and there was a lot of armed conflict inside the army, people were getting killed, and that meant that a lot of Zipra people left and they went back to the rural areas fearing for their lives. And we saw in 1983 the Gakuruhundi campaign in Matabeleland, which led to thousands of civilians being killed and eventually breaking Zapu and bringing them into ZANU-PF, where Mugabe became executive president. And just as we've seen in all the other countries, uh, there was an economic structural adjustment program that Zimbabwe had to get into at this point, massive devaluation of the Zimbabwean dollar, and as a result there was uh, discontent from students and workers, which triggered the fast-track campaign and the payouts to the ex-combatants as a short-term measure uh, to defend ZANU-PF. Okay, so that's a, a whistle-stop tour of what was happening in countries around us. So when we think back to our negotiations role play now in Kodesa, this is what had been happening in the subcontinent. Now we need to look briefly at what happened in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Okay, so in the Soviet Union we had Brezhnev, who was a long-standing leader, died after 18 years, and then there was a period of instability in the Soviet Union because everybody who, who followed after him died within very quick succession. So we had Andropov who came in, Chernyenko came in, they all died. And then Mikhail Gorbachev became Secretary General of the CPSU in 1985. And by that time, the Soviet Union was in quite serious economic difficulties. Uh, it had old technology. There were, there were very serious environmental consequences for, uh, as a result of its uh, industrialization trajectory. So they proposed political and economic uh, reform, and obviously we had the legacy of Stalinism uh, in the Soviet Union with millions of people uh, having been sent to uh, the Gulag and, and, and millions of people dying as part of the Soviet Revolution. So we have in 1988 the Communist Party Conference, which now agrees to allow a private sector in the economy. And in 1990, the Communist Party votes to end one-party rule. Boris Yeltsin was elected president in 1990 and first elected leader uh, in 1991. And then we see this extraordinary situation where this newly elected person bans the Soviet Communist Party in Russia and seizes its assets. And the Congress of the De People's Deputies votes to dissolve the Soviet Union. Okay, so we're in the process now where the ANC uh, and, uh, is, has been getting support from the Soviet Union, from the GDR, um, and now it looks like this support is going to, um, going to evaporate. At the same time, in Eastern Europe, there was a whole wave of uprisings against unpopular imposed leaders, and Gorbachev took the position that, unlike uh, previous Soviet intervention, he was not going to intervene to prop up uh, unpopular government. So we had the revolutions of 1989, which just went through Eastern Europe like a pack of cards. Poland, Solidarity, Hungary, the Democratic Front, East Germany, the New Forum, Czechoslovakia, the Civic Forum, Romania, Ceausescu refused any concessions, and there's, if you look at Ceausescu on the internet, I was not going to screen this video because it's incredibly gory. Ceausescu and his wife get taken. They have a summary uh, trial, and they are shot by a firing squad the next day. So this was a, mostly a peaceful process, but in certain instances it was quite short and, and violent. In East Germany, 
a whole series of mass public rallies lead to the fall of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November 1989. Okay, so this was cast at the time as possibly the end of history. Someone called Francis Fukuyama uh, took this. But I just want to show, play you this clip from the time so that you can... Uh, this is a retrospective. I couldn't find an uh, actual clip from the moment, so it's sort of a historical um, reconstruction. But just to, to be able to read the mood of people from, from this video. It's 25 years now since the events of a revolutionary year. The Berlin Wall, a physical symbol of the Cold War, was torn down. A wave of protest spread across Eastern Europe from Poland to Romania. <laughs> Okay, so those, those are just some scenes from the time, which, you know, just gives you a sense they're very similar to sort of scenes of jubilation and what have you that we would have seen in South Africa. But what this did was also reflected the triumphalism of capital and the acceleration now of neoliberal economic policy. So we've been in a world up until for many decades that's been, uh, been the, the sort of theater of the Cold War, of having different power blocks, and now the one unfolds and takes on the capitalist agenda. So we have now a quotation which was used by Joe Slovo in his Has Socialism Failed, which I'm going to come and look at very briefly in a second. Uh, this is from Professor Robert Heilbronner uh, from the Harvard Law School, who says that less than 75 years after it officially began, the contest between capitalism and socialism is over. Capitalism has won. The great question now seems how rapid will be the transformation of socialism into capitalism and not the other way around. Okay, so the SACP uh, in South Africa reflected on this process and produced that uh, very important paper. Joslova produced that very important paper in 1989 where he talked about the dramatic collapse of the party governments, the mounting chronicle of crimes and distortions in the history of existing socialism, its economic failures, and the, and the divide which developed between socialism and democracy. And he said that this had created shockwaves of very necessary self-examination for communists outside and inside the socialist world. So how did all of this impact on the role play scenario that we were in and the transition, the democratic transition? So if we run through our history at speed, I'm not going to speak to these things, I'm just going to flash them up. You can read them, you know this history, this is very familiar to you. And this is what we've been talking about in the last couple of days. We have a whole series of events happening. We also have major disinvestment and capital flight and the, the bite of sanctions on the South African economy. And in 19, 1989, we have the launch of a new defiance campaign in South Africa. They make the country literally ungovernable. So this is where we get to the Harare Declaration uh, that we had as the precursor to our role play. And this is what we had in our role play introduction. So. In 1989, as we've mentioned, Joe Slovo reflected on this has socialism failed, and he said the fault lies with us and not with socialism. Well, we're going to have to determine whether, in fact, that was the case. Uh, very shortly afterwards, there was the suspension of the armed struggle, and the ANC government accord set in motion a plan for the phased release of political prisoners and indemnity for returning exiles. And then we get into the negotiation process that you've been talking about and we've covered now in the introduction to the role play. And then I finally got three slides that just reflect on the, on, on the negotiated process. So in 1995, Adler and Webster commented as follows. While South Africa stands at the threshold of a historically unprecedented democratic order, the constraints on the transition 
have never been more apparent. After decades of opposition to apartheid, culminating in the insurrectionary period of the 1980s, pro-democracy forces are participating in a government of national unity in which their main enemies are their partners, and they face a global economy that dictates neoliberal market-based policies as the only acceptable solutions. Radical possibilities seem to have evaporated. While activists bravely accept that half a loaf may be better than none, few started out with this goal in mind. And then Frank Mankes, uh, in 2013, uh, wrote quite an important piece where he, he urged us to look back on Codessa, and that's what we're trying to do in this particular session. So he wrote as follows. Codessa played a vital role in bringing the new South Africa into being. Since no side could claim victory, adversaries were forced to negotiate. Codessa focused on the restoration of political rights, and there were significant outcomes. Restoration of democracy and dignity for all, as well as the founding of democratic institutions to secure and advance democracy and human rights into the future. But Codessa did nothing to rearrange economic power. It was silent on the need for ownership changes in major corporations. It sent no message about the need to reverse injustice in land ownership. And so 20 years on, South Africa is at another stalemate. Although we have a legitimate government and levels of violence in no way match the early 1990s, we are once again witnessing scenes of well-armed policemen facing off against protesters. The country is rocked by a wave of strike action and there are ongoing service delivery protests. Much of the community level mobilization is around bread and butter issues but there is also growing mobilization around bigger issues, such as demands for the return of land and the nationalization of the mines. My final slide, I just want to uh, give you a quote by Manuel Castells. And I think whatever we, um, however closely we get focused on our South African reality, what Castells is warning us about is the nature of economic change globally and the processes that it, it, it has unleashed. So I'm not going to have time to, uh, to explain a network, network society, but I'm going to pick up the quote in the middle. It's not just poverty, it is that the global economy and the network society work more efficiently without hundreds of millions of our co-inhabitants of this planet. Thus a major contradiction. The more we develop a highly productive, innovative system of production and social organization, the less this core needs a substantial proportion of the marginal population, and the more difficult it becomes for this population to catch up. And this is effectively the space that we find ourselves in globally and in South Africa, where we're seeing more and more joblessness and very uh, increasing limitations on the scope of the economy to absorb the, the jobless uh, crisis that we have. Okay, so that was my attempt to try and take us from Codessa out and bring us back in again. Thank you.